We're going to go and look at the actual CVs for some of these in a, in a minute, but let's take a look at what, how we can study the effect of chemical reactions looking at the cyclic voltammograms themselves. The observable parameters that we can see in a, a cyclic voltammogram are things like um, the peak current, the limiting current, if we have something like that, the half wave potential, or the E peak. And these will all be what they call forward parameters because they're occurring on the initial wave, the first wave out. And we can have reverse parameters such as IPA or IPC. Delta E peak would be another example of uh, the reverse parameters. Let's take a look at some of the forward parameter effects. Forward parameters such as um, I peak or IL. Now both of those, it would depend pretty strongly on the exact reaction that we're talking about. So we'll have to specify the reaction that we're actually doing. Now for EC reactions, What might we expect? In this case, since we're form going from, it's a, say it's a one electron or an N electron process to R, R is no longer involved in the reactions. Suppose K here is really fast. As soon as R is made, it, it disappears. How many electrons are we going to see in this process? Would you expect to see more than one electron? Probably not. So the peak current is going to give you the peak current for essentially a one electron process, and so the peak current shouldn't be affected much. Uh, we can't really say it's going to be the same exactly as the non-perturbed electron transfer case, but it should be very small effect. What about the catalytic case? Now the current is going to increase a lot because in this case, in the catalytic case, we've, we're feeding back some species from the initial reaction. So depending on the strength of the catalytic process, how rapid that catalytic process is, which will depend on the rate underlying the catalytic process, the electron transfer and solution, which is part of the catalytic process, and the catalyst concentration, those will have uh, effects on the rate constant. But one thing we can say for sure is that at short times, and short times has to be defined in terms of the rate underlying the catalytic process, so if times are short compared to the time scale of the catalytic process, the uh, I is not affected by a K. But otherwise, uh, much current increase. What about uh, the potentials? If we look at our uh, O to R, R to Z situation again, what's going to happen to the potential for the reaction? Remember, that the reaction in this case is um, we're having a reaction that let's just suppose it's a reversible reaction. We've perturbed the equilibrium situation. And if the initial E reaction is reversible, then we have a Nernstian equation type of situation that we, a Nernst equation type situation where we can write out a Nernst equation for the solution surface potentials of those 
our surface concentrations of those species. So it's the concentration of O over the concentration of R at the electrode surface. Now when we have a chemical reaction, C sub R is going to be reduced at any particular potential because of the chemical reaction that's occurring. So we're going to shift the wave to more positive potentials. So as K increases, EP or E1 half will be more positive. So as the reaction occurs, somewhat unintuitively, you'll see an irreversible wave, but it, instead of uh, electrochemical irreversible, where well, we shift more negative with increasing heterogeneous electron transfer rate constant. With chemical reaction rate uh, causing irreversibility, we're going to shift more positive. So the reaction occurs at a more positive potential. And that's going to just increase as long as K is very fast, or fa as long as K is significantly fast. And the faster it gets, the more it's going to perturb the equilibrium process. What about reverse parameters? Well, no, IPA over IPC. IPA over IPC. Normally, remember that's one for a uh, a non uh, for a reversible case. Um, with EC reactions, that ratio is going to change dramatically. As soon as we have an EC reaction, IPA essentially drops to nothing, and so that value goes to zero. So it goes from say one to zero, and that would indicate to you that there is some sort of chemical reaction going on. The other thing that we can look at, in fact we can vary, are the time window for the reaction. We're not stuck at a single time scale, and that's one of our biggest advantages with cyclic voltammetry is we can change the time scale of experiments simply by changing the dial on an instrument. We can go faster or slower. And by studying the effect on the parameters that we observe with the time scale of the experiment, we can really get some good information about what's going on in the system. So let's take a simple reaction, A to B with a homogeneous type reaction. That's a first order reaction. Uh, if we s s so say, and we can write down a uh, time scale, which we can call a characteristic time. And now going to be one over And that, if we wait one over k times, that's going to give us 37 percent of our initial concentration of A. So it's not the half-life exactly. Half-life would just be a different per, a multiplier. But you can think of one over k as our 37 percent of our initial amount of k. So just taking the reciprocal of our rate constant, we can get some sort of a time scale for our experiment. And we say, well, if we're in the reciprocal of our rate constant, if we're in that range and our cyclic voltammetry experiment is in that same time scale range, we're going to start to see significant effects of our chemical process. For second order reactions, say you have 2A to B, or let's call it C. T2 has a slightly different form and it's going to be a K, 1 over Kc the larger the amount of uh, concentration we've got of our reacting species, the faster that reaction is going to take place. So Kc together is going to give us our time scale. So 1 over Kc gives us 50 percent, and C is the concentration of A, I should say, to 50 percent of the initial. So if 
if we look at that, we say, well, if, if the reaction is very fast, if K values are very large, or the concentration for secondary reactions are very large, that means that if we do time experiments that are slower than the reaction, we might expect the reaction to be dominated by the chemical process. But we can outrun the chemical reaction by making our experiment operate on a faster time scale than these time windows. So if we say that K is, let's say, one second, or K is one reciprocal second for a first order reaction, and we're doing experiments that are taking less than a tenth of a milli, or 10 milliseconds to run, we might not expect a significant chemical process to, to affect to be seen. We're not gonna see a significant effect of the chemicals, chemistry. How can we judge the time scale of our experiment? Well, it depends on the technique, and there's a table in the book, I think, about this. And I'm gonna have to write this a little differently, so let me do that. Um, that's a technique, a time parameter, the range, and the window. Technique for, say, chronoamperometry. is the time parameter is tau, the step width. We can adjust the length of the step from very short to very long. Uh, the range can be variable with traditional methods with larger electrodes. It was on the range of say 10 to the minus five, which is really pushing it to 50 seconds. With microelectrodes, some people have been able to work down in the nanosecond time scale, large numbers of nanoseconds, so hundreds of nanoseconds. So we can drop that range down a little bit more, but those are pretty tricky to, uh, to do. So we'll continue our 10 to the minus five as a typical lower limit. The upper limit with chronoamperometry is the limit imposed by diffusion. Remember when we have diffusion and convection occurring, <coughs> the convection is gonna start screwing up the, con the diffusion process. So 50 seconds would be a s uh, upper limit for our sy system. Cyclic voltammetry. Our time parameter that gives us seconds is RT over FV. And we can go from say 20 millivolts to a second to say 10 to the fifth volts per second. And we can drop a little bit lower than 20 millivolts. And with certain really skillful uh, experiments and very careful experiments, we can go up to maybe a million volts per second if we absolutely had to. But that's about the, the right limit. That means that we can look at time windows of 10 to the minus seventh to, to one second. And again, this 10 to the fifth volts per second is not available with normal larger electrodes. We have to use microelectrodes to get to that situation. Coulometry or bulk electrolysis. And remember, here we're gonna not, we're gonna probably be stirring the solution so we won't have to worry about convective effects. In fact, we're relying on them. And that would basically be the time that we do the bulk electrolysis. And depends on your patients. So let's say 100 to 3,000 seconds would be um, your um, time window or the range of uh, time scales. Rotating disc electrode would be one over the rotation rate is our time scale. Remember the rotation rate is about 30 to 1,000 reciprocal seconds. And so 10 to the minus three to 0 0.3 is our time window. So you can see with using a combination of techniques, we can really explore quite a wide range. We can see from 10 to the three seconds down to the 10 to the minus seven seconds. So 10 orders of magnitude is available in a very well equipped 
uh, electrochemistry laboratory. So you can observe these reactions over quite wide time scales. All right. I think what we'll do now is um, 